Good afternoon, everybody. Getting a little bit of a late start. Lester Hart, Karen, has been patiently waiting for me, but um, I went into Louisville today, and uh, the Red Cross was happy to take another unit of platelets, and of course to uh, tell me also that my temperature was good, and my blood pressure was great, and my heart rate was great, and everything was fine, so they took the platelets, and uh, I uh, made a couple other stops that took a little longer than I thought it would. So here we are, kind of catching our breath. Um, let me also tell you that uh, this, the sixth day of May, brings us about 48 hours, two days, from when we expect Archbishop Kurtz to present to the priest council and his college of consultants uh, in the Archdiocese, a plan for the reopening of churches. Now, I can't give you any hints about what the plan will contain, but he will present that, according to his message on Monday, to the Priest Council and the College of Consultors on Friday of this week. And then that will be released to us, and I can tell you more about it, probably at our broadcast this coming Sunday, Mother's Day, the 10th of May as we do our Masses again from St. Ignatius and St. Ambrose. Uh, again, can't give you any hints about what it's going to say, but um, you'll uh, have a message from the Archbishop this weekend. Um, continuing with the reading of this memoir that I'm writing, The Right Place, The Right Time Memoir of the Kentucky Priest, I won't give you all the background to it again, but if this is your first time to hear this reading uh, and you're curious about it, just contact me in the usual ways. Send me a text to 859-481-8435. Send me an email to f-a-t-h-e-r-b-e-n-b-r-o-w-n at gmail.com. Um, or uh, call me uh, for the voice message and say that you'd like to learn more about the background of this, but there's no point in uh, those of you that are tuning in having to hear the same stuff over and over again. We are in the segment called 1633 to 1947. 1947 being the year of my verse, 1633, being the um, arrival of Catholics uh, from England to Maryland, out of which comes the uh, genealogical stock on my father's side. Um, and the genealogical stock on my mother's side are somewhat from the Virginia Protestants and somewhat from Catholics who came directly from Europe to Louisville in the mid-19th century. You'll be hearing more about that. And again, the background to my life as a Kentucky priest. So this is part three of that segment, 1633 to 1947. As these lines are being written, it is early summer of 2019. To be precise, six weeks before the day on which St. Joseph Church in Bardstown observes the 200th anniversary of its original dedication. The church, so-called here because it is and has been since its inception, a parish, has a formal title which has evolved through its history. The beginning, it was a cathedral, the mother church and seat of authority of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Bardstown. Later, it gave up the position of cathedral to the Church of St. Louis the King, and still later to the Cathedral of the Assumption in Louisville. And thus, St. Joseph became known as the Proto, our first cathedral of the diocese. In more recent years, 2001 to be exact, in deference to its historical and cultural significance, it was elevated to the status of a minor basilica and now enjoys the title 
Basilica of St. Joseph Proto Cathedral. It has also enjoyed for many years, at least since 1934, the official status of historical landmark with recognition as such by the Kentucky Heritage Commission and the American Buildings Survey of the United States Congress. Of course, a great deal can be and has been written about this first edifice of its kind on the American frontier. The scholars referenced earlier, Martin Spalding, Ben Webb, Clyde Cruz, all provide invaluable coverage. Father Howlett, too, at the beginning of the 20th century, gives his account of the connections between Bishop Flaget's first residency at St. Thomas Farm of Poplar Neck, where Howlett himself had studied, and the building of St. Joseph. Also, Herman Schaunger at mid-century provides in Cathedrals in the Wilderness a well-researched account of the setting in which the first inland diocese and its seat of authority and worship came to be. The biographical accounts of Flaget, David, Badin, Nearance, the Spaldings, and others give access to information about the proto-cathedral, which needs not be repeated here. However, I would briefly present, as much for the sake of the tourist as for the researcher, some significant dates and two details which are often overlooked in the telling of this truly sacred story. It was, as Schaumger writes, quote, one day in mid-July of 1812, when Bishop Flaget had just celebrated Mass at St. Joseph Parish, located near the cemetery on the north side of present-day Bardstown, when he, with Father David, met with principal men of the congregation to talk over plans for building a cathedral and for raising money toward that end. Flaget had been in Kentucky for 13 months. Jean-Baptiste David, who had been and would continue to be Flaget's right hand until 1841, provides the proposed dimensions of 120 feet in length by 60 to 70 feet in width with pillars in Gothic style, unquote. In some ways, more significantly, David writes this paragraph. And what will surprise you still more is the fact that the Protestants want it as much as the Catholic, and that they have said openly that if it were a question of a small church, they would not contribute willingly. But if we wanted to build a good, large, substantial church, they would contribute generously. People will tell you that money is too scarce in Kentucky. But here the subscriptions are made in cash, or in trade. One individual has already offered the limestone, another the lumber. Others will pledge so many days' work as carpenter, joiner, mason, etc. No one here doubts success." End quote. Schauger points out that David's enthusiasm notwithstanding, those materials were only beginning to be gathered six months later, and, quote, six years were to elapse before the building began in earnest. Then it suddenly seemed to leap into existence, which would not have been possible without the preliminary work and planning of the years before, unquote. When it did leap into existence, 
There were no doubt many seemingly fantastical, even miraculous dynamics which came to bear on the bringing of Flaget's vision to reality. Certainly the generosity of the populace was very real and sacred, as well as essential to the realization of the dream. It also gives rise to an imaginative story which was generated and passed down through the years. I received it from a man named Adrian Cusick, who with his wife raised two devout daughters and further generations. In his retirement years, Adrian would spend many hours at St. Joseph, always eager to serve as a volunteer custodian and even an unofficial docent informing visitors about the historic place. As people gazed at the tall, stately columns and their paired arrangement through the length and breadth of the nave, Adrian would say, One day, as Bishop Flange was walking through the woods, he saw these twelve poplar trees growing two by two, and it made him think of the twelve poplars. He said, praised the Lord, and built the cathedral around those trees. Cusick was correct, at least regarding the species. Modern day renovations have included a plexiglass panel at the base of one of the columns so that the visitor can see the hand-hewn poplar log. Father Hamlet tells us that the cornerstone of the cathedral was placed on the 16th of July of 1816. His contemporary, Benedict Webb, tells us that the bishop authorized, quote, the subscriptions and cash, cash collections, unquote, <coughs> early in the next year, and indicates that they were found to aggregate the sum of $14,000. Cruz tells us that $10,000 was subscribed by Protestants of the town who, quote, constituted half the directors of the building program, unquote. Cruz also writes of Maximilian Godefroy, who, well, as a fellow Frenchman, was the choice of Flagey and David as the architect of the cathedral. They were well acquainted with his work on the chapel of the seminary in Baltimore. Perhaps because of Godefroy's work on the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore, dedicated in 1818, the architect did not deliver plans for Bardstown in a timely manner. The Flagey turned to a local builder, John Rogers. He had moved to Bardstown from Baltimore in 1815, and his family would go on to make other significant contributions to the life of the diocese. Even though the cathedral would not be considered complete until 1823, it was usable and all were eager for the dedication. Completely unprecedented in this part of the nation, this would be an enormous event. And the appointment of the speaker for the occasion was something to which the bishop would give careful consideration. He could call on David, for whom Flaget had already received papal approval to elevate to the position of auxiliary bishop, which would take place in the cathedral, one week following the dedication. There was also another fellow Sulpician, Guy Shabbat, who had been the first man whom Flagge had ordained to the priesthood as one of his sons in the diocese. <clears throat> there were the pioneer missionaries of Baden and Nerex who had served a combined three decades on the frontier. All of these men would be speaking French, Flemish, or English as a second language. So then consideration could be given to Wilson, Fenwick, Tuit, or any of several Dominicans who after all were English speakers 
as well as members of the order of preachers. But like Samuel of old, who passed over the first seven of Jesse's sons to choose David, the least likely to be king of Israel, you can reference that in the first book of Samuel, chapter 16, verses 4 to 13. Lager selected Robert Abel. Born in Kentucky among the first families of the League of Sixty, and a priest ordained less than one full year to preach the Sermon of Dedication on the 8th of August of 1819. Robert Abner Abel was born when Kentucky was, in 1792. With his brother Jesse, they represented great promise to their parents, Robert and Margaret Mills Abel, when they were born not long after the couple migrated from Maryland to Kentucky. Like the rest of their contemporaries, they farmed land near streams, in their case, Hardin's Creek and the Rolling Fork River in present-day Marion County. Resourceful, as was typical of frontier women, Margaret needed to rely on her sons because their father died when the older boy was but 10 years of age. Possessed of unusual physical strength, the boys worked the fields alongside the slaves. Observant, though, of their natural reflectiveness and analytical skills, Margaret schooled her sons, especially in the winter months. She also allowed them to attend public speeches and debates provided by figures such as Felix Grundy, Matthew Walton, and their fellow Catholic John Lancaster, and others who were helping to shape the constitutions of the new commonwealth, as well as publicly addressing the issues of the day. By 1807, Robert was attending the Dominican College of St. Thomas Aquinas, where he came under the mentorship of the eloquent Samuel Wilson. He also made the acquaintance of William T. Willett, who in 1816 would become the first Kentucky-born priest as he was ordained to serve as a Dominican. Entering seminary studies in 1811, Abel would claim a similar distinction as he was ordained for service in the diocese. Robert Abel's skill at public speaking evidenced itself while he was still a teenager. A delightfully humorous story is the account of the occasion when, on a break from his farm chores, Robert spontaneously entered and won an oratorical competition. However, another story with its own element of humor is the one for us to consider here, as he prepared what was arguably the most important sermon given by a Catholic in 19th century Kentucky. Webb's account of the story covers four full pages plus two footnotes and yet some of the detail is unclear. Earlier in his history, Webb tells of young Father Abel's ministry in the missions and stations to the west of Nelson County. Some of the places he served, such as Flint Island and Harcourt Station, will sound familiar only to people who live near there today or have examined this local history rather closely. I placed myself in both categories. <clears throat> it seems that Abel was on the circuit on or about the 4th of August when he received the message of his assignment as speaker and that he was directed to come with his prepared text to the bishop's residence in Bardstown, ready to rehearse the address before Father David and His Excellency, Bishop Blaget. 
The intent was that Abel would reflect during the horseback journey and write the sermon once he arrived in Barchtown on the 6th. It is not clear precisely where the ride began. However, Webb indicates that Abel was at that time serving missions in Breckenridge County. Two that we can be certain were in existence were at Hardinsburg on the Ohio River and Axtell near present-day Rough River Resort. <clears throat> what is also certain is that Abel's ride brought him as far as Elizabethtown and Hardin County by nightfall of the 5th of August. Equally certain from Webb's account is the fact that the young priest had just fallen asleep when a person from the mission woke him with word that a member of the congregation was in need of last rites. With no hesitation, the dedicated priest reversed his direction of the previous day and provided the needed service to a man who incidentally survived and who later served as a priest himself. Repeating the trip of the previous day, Abel reached Bardstown seemingly about mid-morning of the 6th of August. Awaiting Father David asked if he had the written text of the proposed sermon for the bishop's review. When Abel replied, no sir, to his superior, and added that he thought he could provide it orally from his ample opportunity for horseback reflection, David instructed him to go to your room at once and write out for the inspection of Bishop Flagey and myself what you propose to say, we cannot trust your inexperience. Obediently, Father Abel went to a room in the seminary, wrote what we would today call an outline, and presumably took a nap. In early evening, he was summoned to the bishop's room where David instructed him to present the sermon text which he appeared to be carrying in his hand, rolled up piece of paper. David said it would be critiqued and returned to the younger priest with instructions for improvement. With a roll of mostly blank paper in his hand, Abel replied, quote, In very truth, my fingers have been clutching the bridle for so many hours that they are really incapable of guiding a pin so as to make my chirography chirography, what we call penmanship, legible to others than myself. If you will but retain your places and give me the use of the candle that is flaming on your side of the table, I will repeat before you the sermon I have prepared for the day after tomorrow. Continue. <clears throat> Continuing the account of the incident directly to historian Webb, Robert Abel describes the dim light and his distance from the candle, such that even if his writing had been legible, quote, I could not have seen a letter, still unrolling my supposed manuscript, I made a pretense of reading. He summarizes for Webb the major elements of the sermon, confiding that only once in the course of my performance, after the delivery of a passage I had endeavored to make particularly emotional, I ventured to remove my manuscript from before my eyes and looked my mentors in the face. There they sat with their hands clasped sobbing like children. I no longer felt that I had anything to fear from their criticism. The dedication sermon 
was successful well beyond the expectations of Flagge, David, and the rest of the Bardstown congregation and their guests. Ben Webb notes, too, that for many years it was discussed by the civil and professional leadership of the community as an example of oratory, quote, of which the criticism evoked was of the highest degree commendatory, unquote. Webb also gives an eyewitness account of an event on the 8th of August of 1869, the 50th anniversary of the dedication of the Proto Cathedral. It was able again. Though too aged and frail to be the designated speaker for the occasion, he nonetheless was invited to make impromptu comments, which he did once more to great effect. Says Webb, quote, it is doubtful if there was a dry eye in the church, unquote. It is also doubtful that Robert Abel was the last priest in Kentucky to waver from blind obedience to his bishop. Nor was he the last priest to be appointed to an important position in spite of his youth and inexperience. He was surely not the last priest to prioritize direct ministry to his flock over administrative expectations. And many another local priest would draw inspiration from his legacy of relying on the guidance of the Holy Spirit even while deceiving his ecclesiastical superiors. It is also worth noting that Robert Abel is but one star in a galaxy of talented leadership which are homegrown from the first years in the history of the Catholic Church in Kentucky. The period between placing the cornerstone in the summer of 1816 and the mass of dedication in the summer of 1819 might have seemed a gap to some historians of the Basilica of St. Joseph Proto-Cathedral in Bardstown, but it was hardly a lacuna for Bishop Flagge, his clerical colleagues, and others who were nurturing the faith community of Roman Catholics still in its infancy in the Midwest. Let's recall that the bishop's priorities besides the cathedral were a seminary and a convent. He had been working on them since coming to Kentucky, even before, and they were literally growing up around him at his residency on the St. Thomas farm, what he called the plantation at Poplar Neck. The preparatory seminary which I attended as a high school student was also called St. Thomas, although it was located throughout its history, 1952 to 1970, in the east end of Louisville in Jefferson County. At the beginning of each school year, new and returning students alike were reminded that our school had its beginning, quote, on a flat boat coming west on the Ohio River. Unquote. That historical detail comes from an eyewitness, Jean Baptiste Dubby, who, a member of Bishop Flagey's party on that first trip, later wrote to a friend in France that, quote, the boat on which we descended the river became the cradle of our seminary and the church in Kentucky, unquote. That metaphor cradle was passed down through the decades as can be seen on the bronze plaque established in 1965 by the Kentucky Historical Marker Program at the entrance to what is now the parish property on State Highway 31E south of Bardstown. That marker lists the institutions which we have been calling Bishop Flagey's goals, Cathedral, Convent, Seminary, but also an academy and an orphanage, as well as a parish community. One that is not mentioned, but which began its existence, however short-lived, 
was a religious community known as the Brothers of the Sacred Heart. Having spent their first Kentucky summer at St. Stephen's Farm, the group with Bishop Flaget arrived at Poplar Neck in November of 1811. They built two smaller cabins, which Father Hallett tells us were 18 by 24 feet. While they were not survived, those buildings nonetheless served well for several years, and according to Sister of Charity Mary Ellen Doyle, came to be known as, quote, the laundry and the loom room, unquote. Of several fine books on the Nazareth sisters, this one entitled Pioneer Spirit is exceptionally well researched and recently published, 2006. It was to these cabins that Teresa Carrico and Elizabeth Wells came on the 1st of December of 1812 to begin the realization of Bishop Flaget's desire for an order of women religious. The Sulpician knew of the Daughters of Charity in Maryland and of their spiritual rootedness and the charism of his fellow Frenchman, Vincent de Paul. As it was Christmas time, the name of the new group became the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, hometown in Israel to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. About a month later, the women were joined by a Maryland-born orphan who had just turned 19, Catherine Spaulding. In April and May, the three were joined by three more from the local area, Harriet Gardner, Polly Bevan, and Sarah Sims. Though their noble purpose would be the education of others, they spent their first months together receiving academic instruction themselves, as well as making garments for themselves, the seminary community, and others living nearby. They also ministered to the elderly, which presaged their enormous contribution to the healthcare industry. On the day after Easter of 1813, the sisters accepted from Father David a provisionary set of rules for governance and elected Catherine Spaulding as their superior. That simple beginning of a momentous enterprise would be solemnized a bit later in the chapel of the largest of the cabins, which, as on the boat, was serving multiple functions. In addition to the regular experience of daily mass and formal prayer, this seminary chapel, the seat of the bishop's authority, was functioning in these first years as a cathedral. In reading about Flaget's first companions in ministry on the frontier, we encounter words such as cleric, subdeacon, and deacon as well as phrases such as clerical tonsure and minor, major orders. We learn, for example, that one of the companions is Father David, a priest who will become a bishop in Kentucky. Another is Guy Chabrat, a subdeacon, who after their arrival will become a deacon at Holy Cross Church on Fottinger's Creek, and a priest, the first ordained in Kentucky, at St. Rose in December of 1811. He was ordained a bishop in the Bardstown Cathedral on the 20th of July of 1834. Seminarian Peter Schaefer, who like Charles Nerix was from Belgium, was, quote, raised to the subdiaconate, unquote, in late autumn of 1813 and to the diaconate on the 13th of March of 1814. Jacques Derrigaud, who, like Plage, came from the Auvergne region of south central France, became a subdeacon on Pentecost Sunday of 1814 and a deacon about 18 months later. All four of these ceremonies took place in the chapel of the log house.
Now these terms, deacon, subdeacon, cleric, along with several others, are part of a lexicon, some of which has become rather anachronistic to us since 1972, when Pope Paul VI reformed the system. However, they were fairly significant for a rather long swath of the history of Roman Catholicism, particularly in the context of worship and seminary education. So it is worthwhile for us to consider them here, as we will see their effects on the architecture of St. Thomas and other churches, and the role they will play in my life as I am the priesthood in the 1970s. From the time of the Edict of Milan, issued by the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great in 313 of the Common Era, until the first decade after the Second Vatican Council, which was 1962-65, the distinction between the clerical and lay saints and the further categories of minor and major orders within the clerical state, for better or for worse, held a position of prominence in the Catholic experience. In this context, the use of the word state is more closely aligned with the meaning of status than with a geopolitical value. A member of the clerical state or clergy would have a different status than a member of the lay or non-clerical state, the laity, one of the dynamics which plunged French society into revolution during the time of Bishop Flaget was this very segregation. But we must look at its origins much earlier. Some distinctions were made even in the time of the apostles, as we read in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, with the selection of the first deacons. By the way, that happens to be the reading for this coming Sunday's Mass. More ranks and positions were to develop, however. They were not so visibly pronounced because almost the entire experience of being a follower of Christ was clandestine. Worship was in hiding, literally underground. However, when toleration began with the Emperor's Edict early in the 4th century, Worship could become public. Church buildings could become constructed and used. Ceremonies began to include processions and groupings developed. Identities were based on spiritual gifts, charisms, and functions, such as those listed by St. Paul in his letters, especially 1 Corinthians and Ephesians. Gave people various roles in the community. As church buildings developed, they were often sectioned so that people could sit in a place proper to their status or category. Thus, there was a place for widows, a place for the unmarried, a place for teachers, for interpreters, caregivers, and so on. These were typically roles for members of the laity. Other roles, considered clerical, were step toward ordination. Ordination, in which one receives the sacrament of holy orders, was and continues today to be the way in which one becomes a deacon, priest, or bishop. These are known as major orders. However, there were minor orders, which included in reverse sequence, subdeacon, acolyte, exorcist, lector, and portrait. Each of these minor orders was a step on the ladder toward ordination to service as a deacon, to presiding as a priest, to the fullness of priesthood as a bishop. They were all minor as well as major roles in the clerical state. And the first rung on the ladder, the right of admission to the clerical state, to being a member of the clergy, was tonsure. Each position had its own ritual, although they often took place together in one ceremony, 
and each had its own garb and symbol. For a bishop, it was a mitre and crozier. For a priest, a vertical stole and chasuble. For a deacon, a diagonal stole, dalmatic, and book of gospels. For a subdeacon, no stole but a tunic. For an acolyte, cassock, surplus, and cruis. For an exorcist, cassock, surplus, and candle. For a lector, cassock, surplus, and book of readings. For a porter, cassock, surplus, and door keys. For the first level cleric, cassock, surplus, and tonsure. We need not give details of each of these ceremonies except perhaps the last in our list and the first in the order of ascending sequence. It was indeed perceived as an ascent in status and truly a segregation as one left the lay state and entered the clerical state. The aspirant, one led by the spirit, prevested in a cassock would kneel before a bishop, and as a cantor or choir chanted, You, O Lord, are my portion in cup, from Psalm 16. The bishop would cut the person's hair with at least four slices in the form of a cross. This description is from modern times, as I, a secular cleric, would know it. In medieval times, this would be closer to what is experienced in monastic and religious orders today. The presider might be an abbot or superior general, and the hair would be more extensively and precisely cut, leaving a corona or circle of hair of approximately one inch in width. Then the new cleric would don the surplice clothed in the grace of Christ. When visitors enter the parish church at St. Thomas, Neck today, they are told it is the oldest Catholic church in the Midwest, which we will learn merits great pride, albeit with some nuance. But one of the questions which those same visitors regularly ask is, why is the sanctuary the section immediately around the altar, so big, fully one-third of the church's entire floor space. The answer is found in the paragraphs you have just read or heard. The men who had been advanced to the clerical state and who had been admitted to orders, minor and major, had places and roles in the sanctuary as opposed to the larger area of the building known as the nave. This word, by the way, nave, comes from the Latin word navus, meaning boat, and it is applied to the idea that the church symbolizes Christ as the seaworthy bark which gets us through the troubled waters of life. The Church of St. Thomas, with its seemingly supersized sanctuary, was begun in 1812 and was available for use by 1816. Built with poplar logs and bricks kiln on the property, it is a slightly smaller version of the Godefroy building being used then at the Sulpician Seminary in Baltimore, which stands today on North Packa Street in that city. As the first brick parish church, St. Thomas was actually preceded in 1807 by the Church of St. Patrick in Danville on land donated to Fathers Baden and Nerich by their friend Daniel McElroy. The building still stands today, although it ceased in 1828 to be a church. Webb writes, quote, in the absence of a properly executed deed, the property had to be sold to cover the donor's debts, unquote. The masses celebrated at St. Thomas in those days were quite different from the masses today 
and not simply because they were in <clears throat> the Latin language, save for the penitential rite, which was Greek, we would not have spoken of the Mass as being celebrated. The Mass was said or read, and it was centered around one priest. Indeed, it was referred to as his Mass. Others in the sanctuary, clerics in various stages of their aspirations to the priesthood, would were a kind of ornamentation, pointing to and enhancing the main role of the priest or bishop who was the effective factor in making the mystery happen. Non-clerics did not come into the sanctuary. Non-males did not come into the sanctuary. Slaves, male or female, were relegated to the loft or the outer edge pews in churches of one floor plan. The masses, too, were categorized with labels such as high mass or low mass. The distinction there was mainly between whether parts of the mass were sung or not, and also the number of candles which were lit. A mass could also be labeled solemn high, in which case the priest or bishop was joined by a deacon and a subdeacon in their appropriate roles and robes. Other participants vested and in position in the sanctuary would be men in various minor orders who would also have other roles such as bearers of the cross, candles, holy water, bells, and incense. When a bishop was leading the ceremony, the word pontifical was added to the label. Thus, the core experience of the Mass could have style variations from the simple low Mass, read by a priest, often alone, to a pontifical solemn high Mass, read by a bishop, but enhanced by singing, symbols, and a cast of people, men, in multiple roles. Well, that's a good stopping place. We will come back there tomorrow and read on the, to this end of the third section. That stopping place <clears throat> is where we're going to see some of uh, Flagey's earliest companions uh, be ordained in the small church at St. Thomas and why they're going to need the larger place of St. Joseph, which at that time was being built in Barkstown. So, <clears throat> thanks for your attention. Thank you, Karen, for your filming. And uh, we'll consider that a wrap. I will uh, see you tomorrow.